So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. John Rizzo to you. John Rizzo's career as a lawyer at the CIA spanned more than three decades, from 1976 to 2009. This period coincided with the modern history of the CIA, and Mr. Rizzo was an observer and participant in every major crisis or controversy affecting the agency during that time. During the first quarter century of his career, Rizzo was a key figure in all of the major events involving the CIA, including the Iran-Contra affair and the Aldrich Ames spy scandal. He was the prime legal overseer for all covert operations conducted by the agency during that time. In a 2009 profile, the Los Angeles Times described Mr. Rizzo as, quote, the most influential career lawyer in CIA history. That's a pretty good... Uh, that's a pretty good description if you, want to, if you want to have someone say something good about you. His forthcoming memoir, Company Man, which I hope he'll give us a sense of today as he speaks to us, uh, chronicles his CIA career, and it's, it's due to be published in January 2014. Shortly after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, Mr. Rizzo became the chief legal advisor for the CIA, a position he held until his 2009 retirement. And as the legal architect for counter-terrorist activities like the Enhanced Interrogation Program and the CIA secret prison system, he became a hugely controversial public and political figure in his final years, which of course makes him hugely interesting to listen to as he talks. On a more personal note, as I was uh, looking for people to bring who could bring to bring to BYU who could provide some expertise, it, I was universally pointed towards Mr. Rizzo as someone who would be a very interesting speaker and someone who could really provide us a very interesting and entertaining uh, presentation. So, Mr. Rizzo, to you. Good morning. It's a uh, it's a real pleasure. Uh, to both be here and also, uh, frankly, to be in the uh, state of Utah. This is this is my first visit here, and uh, it's a uh, for a, for a cloistered uh, Easterner. This is a magnificent uh, campus and a magnificent area. I must say that having I, li I lived a fairly sheltered childhood. I grew up in New England and went to college in Rhode Island and law school in Washington D.C. and basically have lived in Washington uh, every for the last forty or so years. I'm a lawyer. I'm not a. I'm not a um, meteorologist. And I always had this primitive notion that when winter came, if you were in the east, you go west to get warmer. Um, it's 61 in Washington today. Uh, in any event, we are we are uh, delighted to be here, and I was honored to be uh, invited. Um, uh, I was telling uh, Corey and Eric uh, beforehand in terms of my presentation. Um, I. The reason I do I do a number of uh, I've done a number of speaking appearances actually dating back to the time when I was still at the agency uh, general counsel and the re one of the reasons I do them I've always done them enjoyed them is that uh, I enjoyed the interaction with the uh, with the audience so in terms of the format today I will I'll make a few semi uh, semi-prepared remarks, uh, but what I'm really interested in and what I'm uh, not only encouraging you to do, but I'm depending on you to do is I'm going to leave a, a lot of time here for comments or questions or, uh, or whatever, you wanna, whatever you wanna talk about because truly that will, that, that would be, uh, that would, that's what makes these things uh, fun for me. Um, I will give you, I'll see if I can do this and <clears throat> give you a 34 second summary of my 34 year career. Um, Eric uh, hit basically the, uh, the high points and some of the low points as well, but um, the, the, uh, I joined the CIA in 1976. I did not know a thing about the CIA. I, 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 I didn't know anyone who was there. All I knew about it was, you know, the same pulp novels and movies that everyone else uh, uh, was watching. I had no insider connection, so it was really a uh, a total leap of faith to uh, for me to have joined. I was I was in my you know, late twenties. I was restless in my in my uh, legal job I had. So it was really uh, it was pure serendipity, and. Uh, you know, over the years, I I, uh, I mean, I was so I've been I was so lucky uh, looking back on it, um, my career. In that, I was I was introduced to issues 
uh, met people, went to places I, that were unimaginable, uh, would have been unimaginable to me. Um, and there's certainly nothing that college or law school ever uh, ever prepared me for, which is, I mean that in a good way, that it was much better, uh, the experiences I had. So, so uh, you know, I was, as I said, terribly, terribly fortunate. I didn't, I didn't realize that at the time, I think, I was too busy, but reflecting back as I was as I was putting this book together I was really I was really struck by the really good fortune I had now you know like much of American life and certainly much of the uh, life of American national security and foreign policy issues 9/11 was the was a turning point in so many ways and that just happened to coincide with the uh, with the uh, period a month or so after 9/11 attacks I was the deputy general counsel number two position in the office, the general counsel, uh, who was a political appointee, uh, left, not because of 9-11. I mean, he had plans to leave before then, but in any event, I was thrust into the acting general counsel role uh, in November of 2001. Um, total, you know, total, total ironic coincidence. And it was there, after spending 25 years happily under the, uh, under the radar, that, uh, I began, began, it began a period of time up until the time of my retirement where I suddenly, unexpectedly, uh, became a uh, public figure. And um, uh, it, was a, it was a new and searing uh, experience for me. I was nominated, and President Bush nominated me in 2005 to be the CI General Counsel. It was a presidential appointment, Senate confirmation. So the presidential appointment part was... Uh, was easy, relatively speaking. I was the first career CIA lawyer to be nominated for the top job, but then came the Senate confirmation process, which was not, which was uh, well, it was eventful. Let's put it that way. I um, I am the uh, I am the guy. Um, uh, the so called the the uh, CIA enhanced interrogation program, uh, which you know became became famous or infamous uh, depending on your point of view. Which included the waterboarding technique, all of that. You may recall there was there were legal memos prepared by the Department of Justice, signed by Jay Bybee, who Eric tells me has a strong connection here. Uh, uh, so, uh, um, which I didn't actually focus on. Jay Bybee, as head of the Office of Legal Counsel, Department of Justice, signed those opinions. I was a lucky guy to whom they were addressed. Uh, and therein, therein began the uh, controversy. So, uh, I, um, I ultimately withdrew uh, my nomination because it was, you know, in the in the face of certain and utter uh, defeat by the uh, Senate. And then, of course, Boston and politics being what they are, I went back to being the acting general counsel. Uh, the same the same position, doing the same things I would have had been doing as a general counsel, only without the title. And the Senate Intelligence Committee, which had pummeled me mercilessly for months, um, shrugged and uh, uh, let me do it. Uh, it was astonishing to me. It was like my whole confirmation process was some nightmare that I'd just woken up from. It had never happened. I mean, I, so I remained there as, as the chief legal advisor, actually into the Obama administration. Again, an astonishing piece of good luck. I mean, I just thought, I just assumed that with the... Obama administration in, of course, candidate Obama made no secret of the fact he thought the interrogation program was illegal, was torture. All of that, I figured I'm not going to last five minutes uh, when this guy gets takes office, which was fine. I was ready to retire, and I was, you know, part of the past. And it was, you know, I, but but uh, as luck would have it, his appointee is CIA director, a guy named Leon Panetta, who I had never met, although he had been a Washington figure for many years. Uh, for whatever reason, told me that he was in no hurry to, to, uh, to uh, for the new guy to be uh, to be uh, to come along. I mean, it was a presidential appointment, so the process was going to take a while. So, I had the unexpected uh, bonus, really, of serving in in what turned out to be my seventh presidential administration. So, for the first year of the Obama administration, I, I against all odds, I remained as acting CIA uh, counsel. So, it was I unexpectedly and happily long goodbye. Um, 
so that's about it. <laughs> that's, the, that's the 34 years there for you. Um, I would, uh, in a immersive, you know, shameless self-promotion, this is the, this is a galley version of the, my memoirs that will be uh, coming out uh, next month. Um, the title of, title of my talk here is, um, is lessons learned and, and amazing and an amazing coincidence that is that is the title of the final section of the book. Um, so I am going to I'm not going to necessarily quote verbatim because I, I don't want to put you through that that uh, bo um, degree of boredom. But I'm, I'm going to crib from it, uh, and I've never spoken publicly about what what is what is in the book. So if you your indulgence, I am going to, for the balance of these uh, prepared remarks, I am going to um, speak, make, make uh, some of the same points I made uh, at the end of the book about the lessons I learned during my long career and what I see, uh, uh, in my humble opinion, for what the role of intelligence in the agency will be uh, in, the, uh, in the years to come as we as we have now entered the second decade of the post-9-11 era. Um, okay, let me, let me first, in terms of lessons learned and look forward, let me uh, briefly address the uh, momentous, fateful years since the attack of, of September 11th. To me, the most ironic lesson to be drawn by the post-9-11 era is this. It is far le less legally risky and in many quarters considered far more morally justifiable to stalk and kill a dangerous terrorist than it is to capture and aggressively interrogate one. That, that at least seemed to be the de facto consensus that emerged over the first post-9-11 decade among influential segments of the U.S. Congress, the media, and the human rights community. How else is one to explain all, this, all the noisy outrage and long, splosh, splashy investigative articles about CIA secret prisons and interrogation techniques, while all the while, this is in the early years after 9-11, while all the while Al-Qaeda Al operators were getting blown to bits in plain sight by U.S. drone aircraft without generating a ripple of criticism anywhere in the Congress, the media, or any international human rights organization. To these entities, apparently, killing didn't appear to be that big a deal up through the time, at least up through the time I retired at the end of 2009. By contrast, for many of us at CIA, being direct, directed by the President of the United States to target people for death, even al-Qaeda terrorists, was always a big deal. Late in his administration, President Clinton had issued some ambiguously worded and highly caveated directives to the agency about killing bin Laden and his cohorts. But with bin Laden nowhere to be found and the agency frankly being unable to find him in those years, uh, that moment, of course, bin Laden's d demise would not come until the night of May 2nd, 2011 in that walled compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. I still frankly find it so odd, so perverse, that the, same, that the same groups that were so stridently attacking the agency's interrogation program is not just lawless, but morally repugnant, until recently couldn't seem to muster a scintilla of concern about a program of summary targeted killings, even one that occasionally caused the deaths of innocent bystanders that was being simultaneously conduct conducted with results all the world could see. From the earliest days after 9-11, our priority, the agency's priority, was to capture al-Qaeda leaders, not kill them. Except when it came to bin Laden, whenever the location of an important al-Qaeda operative came on the screen, our preferred option was to take him into custody, if at all possible. In February 2002, when the first so-called high-value high terrorist detainee was captured, a, 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 a character named Abu Zubaydah, um, the agency, we in the agency ordered, or the, um, ordered our Pakistani colleagues who actually made the uh, capture to take him alive. 
Zubeda, however, decided, declined to go quietly and was seriously wounded in the ensuing gunfight. But rather than let him die, the agency moved heaven and earth to get him the best medical care that, that ultimately saved his life. Zubeda and, and a little later, uh, about a year later, uh, the, the ringleader of the 9-11 attacks, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, were both become the most prominent subject of the CIA interrogation programs. And they also became, at the same time, and not coincidentally in my view, the most productive uh, sources of information uh, that, that came out of the inter interrogation program. That the CIA so instinctively and insistently in hue to this approach shouldn't be surprising. First and foremost, we are, CIA is, an intelligence collection organization. And collection of intelligence from human beings has always been in the CIA's institutional DNA. Always has been, really, ever since I, I joined. And you, obviously you can't collect intelligence or anything about whether it's about an upcoming terrorist attack or anything else for that matter, from a dead man. It's as simple as that. Accordingly, during my time in the post-9-11 years, killing terrorists was not the final option, and it was certainly not the only option. Now, flash forward to today. Times have changed indeed. As, this, uh, as I speak today, the, they, bin Laden has been dead and buried for more than two years. Of course, the CIA's interrogation program has been dead and buried for four years. It was, you may recall, it was one of the first uh, acts President Obama took when he uh, uh, assumed office, issued an executive order two days into his presidency, abolishing the interrogation program, uh, and for good measure, uh, declassifying in their entirety uh, all of the um, all of the Justice Department Office of Legal Counsel uh, memos. Uh, that were issued to me, uh, which gave me one final burst of uh, uh, publicity in my last uh, waning months at the uh, at the agency. I should note parenthetically that it was it was um, unprecedented in my experience for an incoming administration to so suddenly and totally uh, declassify what had heretofore been a a uh, a covert uh, a sensitive and highly classified covert action program. I'd never seen that before. In any, in any event, by all appearances, we are, the agency uh, today is out of, is, is out of the interrog interrogation uh, business, I assume, forever. So what continues today to be the fulcrum of the Obama administration's um, um, offensive against al-Qaeda? According to a non to a nonstop stream of media accounts over the past three years, which of course this is all I have to go by now, um, it's killing people, a lot of people, via a relentless and escalating uh, barrage of drone attacks. Even a U.S. citizen or two, apparently, along the way. I don't doubt that virtually all of these people uh, were targeted. Uh, richly deserve their fate. Now, in, in any, uh, another aspect of the drone program is that while it's become incredibly more sophisticated uh, since 9-11, there's still no, no way of ruling out uh, completely uh, so-called what is clinically an insect will be returned or referred to as collateral damage, which, which in real life terms mean innocent uh, women and children being caught in the uh, fire. And that is still inevitably, that is, when you escalate drone attacks, there are going to be more such uh, instances. Um, at the same time, it also seems evident that the U.S. government efforts to capture and interrogate al-Qaeda operatives overseas have effectively ground to a halt. According to media reports, the Obama administration's scorecard in this regard, at this writing, has been a grand total of two terrorists detained overseas. So the question ultimately becomes, at least in my mind, was the Obama administration's enthusiastic embrace of a robust, aggressive policy to kill terrorists um, directly connected to or even compelled by its, its decision to repudiate a robust, aggressive policy of capturing and interrogating them? 
Obama aides, uh, including my old friend and uh, colleague at CIA and now the CIA director, John Brennan, uh, deny that's the case. Uh, well, with all due respect to uh, John, I don't think you need to be a uh, crack CIA analyst to connect the dots on what, on what seems to be going on. Um, which finally will, will take me to the, uh, I will wrap up uh, uh, my portion of the uh, presentation. Let me just end here with the ultimate question about what, in my view, uh, is going to be uh, CIA's assigned anti-terrorism uh, role in the future. Well, one thing I can say, I think, with, with uh, as close to certainty as one can get in the intelligence uh, business, I can't imagine the agency ever again coming close to running secret prisons, detention facilities, or engaging in even mildly coercive uh, interrogation practices. Given the seemingly enduring controversy over the legacy of terms like uh, entered the national lexicon in the last decade, waterboarding, black sites, I can't see uh, any president ever reopening that, that can of worms again. I mean, just for example, the, just, just last year, uh, the huge controversy that, that, uh, that ensued after, the, uh, after uh, the movie Zero Dark Thirty came out, about that first half hour of the um, purported s scenes of CIA uh, conducting uh, harsh interrogations. Uh, just, uh, you know, it re re reinvigorated all the sturm and drang uh, uh, from, from uh, the previous decade. I mean, it's remarkable to me, um, frankly, maybe, maybe it's a little naive, but after all this time with, with the program, as I say, dead and buried for, for years now and never coming back, it's still, it's still, it's still in many ways the third rail of, of national security uh, controversies. I mean, sure, we've, we've had now belatedly some you know, questioning by, by heretofore quiet groups on the, uh, um, on the political side and on the human rights side about, about the uh, Obama uh, administration's policy escalating uh, drone attacks. And sure, more, more recently, in light of the Snowden disclosures, we've had controversy questions, again, by elements of Congress and by the human rights community about, about the seemingly pervasive uh, sur electronic surveillance conducted by U.S. intelligence community in general, and the um, and the NSA in particular. But, but frankly, whenever those, at least in my mind, those controversies have always have always been dwarfed, are still being dwarfed by any mention. Whenever someone brings up again the issue of interrogations and what is torture and what isn't, it's, I mean I am reconciled to it honestly to to following me for the rest of my life, and you know so be it. But it's remarkable the durability it's had in the in the in the in the nerve it has struck, uh, and, and seemingly f uh, forever in the American political and cultural, legal, and certainly national security uh, psyche. Um, and and uh, as I say, I think that's going to uh, going to continue. Uh, okay, it's twelve thirty. As I say, I. I uh, I really uh, enjoyed this part coming up, uh, and I hope you will indulge me with, with whatever questions or comments you want to make about anything, really. I mean, you're looking at a guy, so for better or worse, uh, uh, whose, whose career uh, neatly, uh, the arc of my career neatly encompassed the, the evolution of really the modern, of the modern CIA, the, the area of era of CIA being subject for the first time, frankly, to, to laws, regulations, congressional oversight, uh, and uh, not to mention the role of lawyers. I should have mentioned at the beginning that when I joined in, in, uh, as a green kid in 1976, the, the agency had a grant. I was the 18th lawyer hired. Uh, what I didn't know when I came in was that six months before, the agency only had nine lawyers. I was part of the first hiring binge at CIA of CIA lawyers. When I retired at the end of 2009, we had 125 lawyers, uh, and I, I, I'm told uh, by my former colleagues that's now up to about uh, 150. Um, 
So uh, one, of the, one of the many, many ironies looking back on my career is that, is that every time there's a controversy or crisis or a mess up that CIA was involved in, and Lord knows we seem to have a facility for getting into a, some sort of mess every three or four years, the immediate hue and cry in the aftermath would be, well, you know, CIA needs to hire more lawyers. So ironically enough, the, the fact that these scandals might have been poisonous for the uh, for the uh, agency's image and uh, reputation, it, uh, perversely enough, it was always a great hiring boon for for uh, our office of general counsel. So that's it. Um, so please ask me or uh, anything. Okay. So you see the microphone over there. If, if you have a question, if you want to line up behind the microphone, and please. When you have your question, state who you are and uh, y your affiliation if you want, and then uh, ask the question. Since I get the prerogative to ask the first question, I'm going to take that now. <laughs> I, I actually have a long list here of questions, but let me just start with one that was really two questions, but I'm only counted as one. Uh, and that is the first part of this question is, how did you face, w when you were faced with ethical issues, i.e., you represented a national interest, you represented an agency, you represented the government, um, how did you how did you balance the responsibilities as a government agent with your own personal moral feelings on specific questions that came to you? And the second part of that question, which is actually completely unrelated, is uh, th th <laughs> recently reported that the CIA was going to hand back drone operations or hand off drone operations to DOD, and then more recently reported that they were not going to hand off drone operations, rather they were going to keep that. Could you talk to why you think that is and whether you think that is a good idea or not? And please, feel free to line up with, with your question. All right, that's a heck of an icebreaker question there. Yeah, uh, I wanted to start easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, in terms of the, the ethical uh, dilemmas, um, I mean, it, it, it was always with me. I mean, it's always it's it's it's, it's, with, it's always with every, anybody who's involved who's with the CIA for a long time career, and is involved in in uh, in delicate, uh, and sensitive, and sometimes, frankly, sort of hair raising kinds of uh, kinds of activities. Um, so, you know, to some extent, I can only speak personally. To some extent, certainly, my early years. You know, I uh, whatever moral misgivings I had uh, about about some of the activities I was overseeing, I had to balance that with my job, my role, which is to provide the best legal advice uh, to my clients in the conduct of those activities. Um, and then on with that uh, included uh, advice about not just on the law, but on whether the course of action was too risky. Uh, frankly, a big consideration always in my mind was, and this is the lawyer in me, I viewed everyone in the agency as my client. And, and any lawyer worth his salt in any profession with your client, one of your key roles is to, one, try to keep them out of trouble, and two, also protect them. For one, they were doing work that they were, they were duly directed to undertake, and which is important and which is risky. So those are my primary roles. The ethical Really, the, the, honestly, the first time I had really serious ethical issues to deal with was in the post-9-11 era, uh, and specifically when the operatives in the CIA Counterterrorism Center first came to me with the idea of, with their view that these, that Abu Zubaydah, who was balking at providing any information, and it was making no secret of the fact that he knew about uh, future attacks, and we weren't going to get the information out of them. Uh, our operatives, our experts, our psychiatrists who were with him, with the beta, were convinced the standard procedures were not going to work. We're not going to be effective on this guy. I mean, these Al Qaeda leaders were, were psychopaths. I mean, bra bra perversely brilliant in some ways, but psychopaths. Um, and then, so I was just, these just techniques were described to me. I didn't know. What waterboarding was, but you know, other these techniques, uh, some of them sounded sort of like out of a Three Stooges comedy routine, you know, holding the face or, you know, uh, uh, facial slaps, things like that. But waterboarding, there were a couple of others that uh, that were terrifying to me. But here we were just 
three months removed from 9-11, our experts were telling me that, that these kinds of techniques, no matter how seemingly harsh and brutal and unprecedented, honestly, in, in my experience at the agency, these were the only kinds of techniques that held any hope of breaking Zubeda's res, uh, resistance. So that was hard. And time was of the essence. Um, because uh, uh, you know, some of you, all of you, remember the first two, three months after 9/11, there was there was this sense, the sense of dread, of inevitability that there was going to be another attack. There was going to be a second catastrophic attack. So the pressure was was immense. So what was one to do? Um, well, they you know, ultimately decided, concluded, and it was a, it was it was not an easy decision on my part. Uh, because I could have stopped those techniques before they even left the building. It would never have happened. I'm confident of that. But then I thought, well, what, what, if, what if, and that would have been a safe course, and that would have been protecting our clients, because I knew, I knew that someday, somehow, the political winds would shift, and these, and these if, if there wasn't a second attack, and ultimately political culture, the pendulum would swing back t to protect us at all costs to, wait a minute, what the hell have you guys been doing anyway? As, as it turned out to be the case. So I could have avoided all that, but, but what if I hadn't? This is a thought process I went through. What if, what if I took that course of action and there had been a second massive attack and it turned out Abu Zubaydah, I'm uh, sure he would have told us, he would have gleefully told us in the aftermath that he knew all about it, but we couldn't get the information out of him. So there I would be thinking, at least to myself, okay, well, I, I was, you know, played a huge role in preventing these techniques from being carried out. Now we have thousands of dead bodies in rubble or on the streets again. And I would have known, I would have known uh, inside my own head that I would have been personally responsible for that happening. And then the final analysis, I just couldn't countenance the thought of having to live with that. So, uh, I mean, it's sort of a case study of that, but of the, about the ethical dilemmas. Uh, I found myself in, certainly in the post-9-11 uh, era. It's easier, frankly, to have ethical problems, ethical dilemmas, when you're not on the top, top of the pyramid. I mean, you know, when, I had, when you have bosses, you know, you sort of, and I had this over the years, I figured, well, they, they know better than I. Well, then you find yourself alone at the top of the pyramid, and you're the guy. So, so that was, um, man, that was hard. Second question. Um, I'm a little constrained about talking about drone operations uh, because it's still a classified program, at least in terms of CIA, believe it or not. I found that uh, out when I tried to write about this subject in my book. But uh, uh, I'll say this about, about drones, whether it be in the military or CIA or, you know, presidents, all pr my experience, presidents love the CIA, love the CIA, regardless of, regardless of political persuasion, because the CIA is secret. You're president of the United States, you issue a directive called the findings of the CIA to conduct something in secret. You don't have to run through some long appropriations process. You don't have to get Congress, you know, the Armed Services Committees and Foreign Affairs Committees. Professor Taylor knows about that, the congressional side of oversight better than I. CIA covert ac action activities are, are exclusively the domain of the Senate, uh, the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. But it's easier. I'm telling you, it's easier to fund these things. It's all in secret. Uh, frankly, countries who are the beneficiaries of these programs still have what they call uh, the old saw plausible deniability. You've seen this in the media that I saw it as far back as the mid 80s during the Contra Wars. You know, countries that would, at a minimum, turn a blind eye or, or more, f more often frequently acquiesce to certain aggressive covert action activities on their soil, of course, do so on the, on, on the presumption that that kept secret. So they can rail about these, about the Yankees, the Americans, and public. So, I mean, the bottom line is CIA covert action is a much more attractive option for a president uh, uh, for any number of reasons than going the more overt military route. And that's why, in my view, that's why I personally will doubt if, the, if ultimately the responsibility for CIA, for the drone program resides exclusively with the Department of Defense. Okay, that was a long answer, I'm sorry. My name is Stan Taylor, John. Yeah, Stan. And uh, 
You spoke about many ironies in your career. I wonder if you've ever thought about the irony of all of the criticism that came a, to the intelligence agencies after 9-11, particularly coming out of the famous commission, 9-11 commission, about the intelligence agencies, uh, the political cartoons were really crude. They, they couldn't connect the dots, was the phrase you heard over and over and over again. And now, you know, this many years later, they have all the dots connected, but now they're getting slapped for doing that. Yeah. Does yeah. that uh, seem a part of your ironical story? <laughs> it, is, it is. It is a piece of that, Stan, yes. Um, you know, I, I cover this, some of this in the book, but frankly, I try not to think about it too much because it would, it would drive me crazy. So, so um, yeah, the, uh, d I mean, uh, you remember because you were there. In the 90s on the, in the Congress, there was a great hue and cry about the CIA uh, getting too, too, too closely involved, getting in bed so-called with nasty, nasty characters around the world, the Guatemalan death squads, the Noriega, uh, you know, uh, you know, the CIA, the CIA it, it lost its moral compass. It's, you know, it was just dealing with too many dastardly people. That was during the 1990s. And Congress, and, you know, pressured CIA to, to undertake all sorts of reforms about, about the kinds of so-called dirty assets it dealt with and all of that. 9-11 happens and immediately hue and cry come, comes up. There, there, were two, there were two sort of buzzwords. One was, why didn't you connect the dots? And two, why were you so risk averse? Why didn't you infiltrate Al-Qaeda? You know, you guys, what are you there for? You, you, you know, what, why didn't you? Why, why, why did you guys, you know, such, such wussies about, about dealing with the toughest characters in the world without a hint of self-awareness? Um, as, I, as I mentioned, the, the, the human cry was, in post 9-11, do whatever you have to do to prevent a 9-11 attack. We don't care. You screwed up first time, you let this happen once, you cannot let it happen again. Okay, so we've taken these unprecedented measures. No attack, no second attack, the years go by and, and all of a sudden the pendulum switch. Those who have been around for years knew this was inevitable. And of course, not having a second attack was a blessed thing, but and then, then, and it, and then increasingly it came, well, you guys, you know, you guys are torturers. What do you think, and this is contrary to all U.S. values. I mean, again, there's no sense of perspective. You know, one of the things I try to do in the book by taking the long views, walk through all these episodes and say, look, this is the way it goes. Pendulum swings and the agency, you know, which is often caught in the middle. So sure, yeah, it's, there are many ironies uh, that, I, that uh, I've seen, but 9-11 uh, and, the, and, the, uh, and, the, uh, and the total swing uh, back and forth. Now, even with the NSA uh, revelations, I mean, I mean, honestly, did, did I mean, the Congress and the media, or or certainly foreign, foreign uh, these foreign uh, countries, really think we weren't doing this kind of thing? And they, you know, that that I mean, this is intelligence collection. This is even covert action. This is what people said. You know, see, I should do more of, more aggressive intelligence collection. Lay off the covert action. Okay, so the intelligence community. Wonderful technology, wonderful capacity to, to collect information, and now all of a sudden, where you know the the, the criticism, the uh, star criticism is, whoa, you know, you're, you're spying on, you know, you're spying on my personal life, you know. Um, I mean, you just live with it. If you're in, if you're in the intelligence community, you just have to roll with it, because because next next month there'll be something else. That's the way it goes. Yes, sir. My name is Dallin McKinnon. I'm an international relations major. And another one of the things we learned from 9-11 was that we had to have more institutional cooperation between federal agencies and departments. I'm just wondering, since your career spanned the pre- and post-9-11 eras, if, if you could maybe describe how effective we've been at instituting that change to have more, uh, a more free flow of information, and if there are still major obstacles that you encountered. Well, uh, well it's, it's, uh, it's improved. Uh, it improved immensely in the post 9-11 era. I mean, I was, uh, I was particularly struck uh, by, by the 
willingness, the newfound willingness on both sides, the FBI and the CIA, to cooperate and share information. I mean, honestly, I was at the agency for 15 years before I even met a, anybody from the FBI. I mean, they were just so, and in retrospect, this was, this, even 9-11 hadn't never happened. Uh, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was dif dysfunctional. It wasn't right, but there was just a clash of cultures. One thing CIA and FBI had uh, in common, of course, after 9-11 aftermath was the, was the uh, understanding that, that neither institution would, would be able to survive if, they, if, another, if a second undetected attack was allowed to take place. So that sort of, I think, more than anything else, pulled both, uh, both agencies together. So the cooperation with the FBI has been, in the years since 9-11, has been uh, night and day. Uh, similarly, with the cooperation with the uh, Department of Defense, the military, has improved, uh, has improved uh, considerably. I actually think my perception, my perspective is that um, it, um, that still needs some, still needs some uh, work. Uh, you know, I, I have a certain bias coming from the intelligence community side, but DOD is so huge and massive, and the, you have the, um, you know, the various elements, the various services, you have the sinks overseas. There's a lot to, there's still a lot of improvement, I think, can be made in, in, in the more traditional intelligence agencies, and CIA remains mo most, more the most traditional and biggest dog in the hunt, to work to integrate operations uh, uh, better with the uh, military in particular and, and DOD in general. But, but since 9-11, the uh, overall level of of um, uh, increased cooperation across the spectrum of national security and foreign policy agencies has been, uh, I mean, as I say, it's just been night and day from the year, from my, my uh, first 20 years or so uh, uh, at CIA. So. Uh, Don Gray, um, actually just got selected for <coughs> drone pilot. Oh. And so I actually had a couple questions about that. Do you think the drone programs will have the same fate as the interrogation programs, and what are the issues that will be come up with? Because I know there's a lot of ethical uh, legalities going on with the, the drone program. I don't think so. I don't think so. Even now, uh, I mean, as I said, in the early years, and again, maybe this was just, this was just us, the CIA, feeling sort of wounded uh, or, or picked on. I mean, it was striking to me that the interrogation program became such such a focus, focus of such outrage. But the, at the same time, the drone program, I mean, people tend to forget, but the Bush administration had a fairly active drone program for years, and people were getting killed, and, and you know, people knew people were getting killed. But there wasn't, there seemed to be this, this unspoken consensus that that somehow was different or better uh, than, than, than aggressively interrogating people. It was, it must have something to do with the political and moral psyche of the of the American uh, Republic. I think drones are here to stay. Um, uh, even today, even today when, when, you know, there are belatedly groups like the ACLU are challenging the drone program. Uh, but really, the political consensus, even today on the Hill, even with the increased use of drones, a wider area is still fairly solid. And honestly, I think drones and I think U.S. presidents and and uh, and b both political parties are much more comfortable with the drone program. And let's face it, it's better than boots on the ground. It's clinical. It's clean. It's effective. Technolo technology, you know better than I. It's gotten better by the day. It was astonishing. I mean, you know, I'm a non-techie, but it was astonishing to me just in those eight years how better it got. So I, I think drones are are going to be are going to be with us. Uh, uh, it's going to be a, a key tool. It will continue to be a key tool, not just in the counterterrorist arena, but I think honestly, it's so tempting. They're so good, and the techno and they're so, let's say, lack of a better term, clean uh, form of warfare that I can see. It, I can see presidents in the future expanding it outside the counterterrorist arena to get into WMD or other areas. So I think I think you uh, you should stay with the. Uh, <coughs> Drones, you'll have a safe and a productive career path for many years to come. Okay, so we may have time for one more question. If not, I've got one. <laughs> okay, I'll ask my question. Oh, um, go, no, go ahead. 
So y you talked about the, the NSA spying on citizens, and but there's also you know the Stuxnet virus, the cyber physical, where they're destroying plants and stuff like that. Do you, can you talk about like the issues around that or where you see that's going? Okay. Well, I can't. You know, I can't get into specific operations that have been leaked in the media because they still are still are classified. But just cyber warfare uh, in general. You know, that's, that's another form of covert action. And, and in some ways, it's sort of like the drone issue. It's, it's tempting because it's, it's you no know, people. I mean, you know, you don't have to have, have fund paramilitary groups to do these things. You, you don't have to physically infiltrate these plants. You, can, you just put a little thing in there, and then if someone is the president says, okay, flip the switch, you flip the switch and it's, you know, as I say, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's attractive. I mean, it's very attractive. I always worried about cyber warfare because I didn't know, at least, at least by my lights, what one was unleashing. When you start down that road, then what, the, then what would the other guys do? Uh, we probably still have the lead in terms of technology and expertise, but other countries will catch up. And once, and always to me that it's a very it's a very perilous path to go down to start start blowing things up that way. One thing, you know, the there's no failsafe system. You, as I understand, you you still can't guarantee that the one target you want to want to disable is not going to have some effect on let's say disabling the air traffic control system of that country at the same time, or the power system, the power grid. So it's not. I mean, cyber warfare obviously is here to stay, uh, but it does, it does, it's always, it always, frankly, I found it a little scary, kind of a scary, potentially scary, if attractive, uh, incendiary um, uh, covert operation device, so. Hi, uh, Andrew Potts, poli sci major. First, love the pink socks with the pink tie. It's a good thank look. You, thank you, Andrew. Um, so I got two <laughs> questions. The second one depends on the first, though. Um, so the first one is, were you ever a personal witness to the enhanced interrogation techniques? I, uh, that's a good question, Andrew. Um, I, I visited the secret prisons because I wanted to see what they uh, look like. Um, I wanted to make sure, among other things, that they were described the way our people are describing to me. Uh, I, it, and I, you know, I've been asked this question, did I ever undertake waterboarding myself? I did not, uh, and honestly, I was never, I was never <laughs> tempted to. Uh, lawyers that worked for me, that worked day, day to day on that program, uh, did take it, did, did undergo waterboarding, because they thought it was important. I did not. I, uh, I mean, it, it, it was um, the way it was described to me, um, and what I, uh, I just, uh, honestly, honestly, I didn't feel the need to do it, and I, didn't I sure as hell didn't want to do it. So, no, I didn't. I, I witnessed some other of the techniques, though. Um, and as I said, some were banal, but some, some were tough. Some were very tough. So what was, so with that, then, what was it like to watch, I mean, Abu Z, I can't even pronounce his last name. Zabeda. I mean, yeah. Zabeda. So was it like watching these, you know, high-value detainees come in stubborn, hard, resistant. What was it like to watch their emotional process just as they were broken down until they finally gave in? Yeah, they, well, they were different. They were different individuals. Some, some took longer. You know, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed under, underwent and sustained more waterboarding than I, w I personally would have thought imaginable. Others sort of caved quickly. Uh, Zubayda had an interesting reaction. He, had, he was the first really guy who was, uh, who was subjected to techniques. He was he was a pretty tough little guy, uh, not nearly in the league that KSM would be, but he he reconciled, and I happened to be uh, I, I I heard about this directly. I wasn't physically there, but once he decided that Allah had, had, had was satisfied that he had withstood and withheld enough, he said that Allah said it's okay for me to now cooperate with you. It's called learned helplessness, as our psychologists called it. So 
I mean, it would tend. So some of these you know, self-described, you know, tough guys, they caved immediately. Uh, I mean, waterboarding was only actually done to three detainees, and we had about a hundred in the program. So most of them, most of them went along uh, after a while. Um, uh, but it, you know, it depended. And as I say, the the techniques themselves, I you know, I. I mean, there's nothing I, I had ever heard of before they were presented to me, and I didn't have a lot of time to, to uh, dwell on them. Um, but in my career before that time, CIA, believe it or not, never, never built secret prisons, never held people communicado, never, never really had done any kind of aggressive technique. So this was all tabula rasa, which made it, you know, both more exciting as a lawyer, but also more perilous and, and more difficult, really. Thank you. All right, please join me in thanking Mr. Rizzo. Thank you.